Hi, everyone. It's Joey Remini from seekingbalance.com.au. And today I have an interview and we're going to talk a little bit about creativity and nature and connection. And it's going to be really interesting where this conversation takes us. But I will say all of these themes are really, I think, dear to my heart. And I think potentially really central to the recovery and healing process um, for chronic illness, chronic symptoms, or just those lingering feelings of depression, isolation, anxiety, not fitting in, not belonging, just all of that icky stuff that as humans, we tend to experience at some point in our lives. So I want this conversation to be a little light and to offer us some of the creative path for moving forwards, opening up, and really shifting and transforming ourselves. So my guest today is Amanda Lewis, who is an author and editor based in Canada. And her recent book, Tracking Giants, is her story of engaging with nature and discovering things perhaps not anticipated. So welcome and thank you for your time, Amanda. Thanks so much for having me on, Joey. Yeah. Yeah. So you're a writer. So, you know, writing a book's not a huge leap, you know. But I'm curious, when you look back now in hindsight of writing your book, Tracking Giants, from that humanitarian or human point of view, what grew in you and what did you learn about yourself and about your relationship to the natural world as you began this journey? And, and you can share a little about your, your book and, you know, yeah, take us sure. on that journey with you. Yeah. Okay. So Tracking Giants is a travel memoir and it, the subtitle is Big Trees, Tiny Triumphs and Misadventures in the Forest. And it's about my search for what we call champion trees and champion trees are the largest trees of their species. Mm-hmm. And when I started this project in British Columbia in Canada, where I live, there were 43 champion trees and I got this idea to go see all of them. And it's funny to me because I'm a book editor by trade. I'm not an arborist, um, aspiring adventurer, but I'd never really done um, much more than a day hike. Like I'd never gone backpacking. I'd never done an overnight hike. And the backstory for how this project all started is I've been living in Toronto and working at a really big publisher called Penguin Random House. Mm-hmm. And I've been working in-house, acquiring books, editing books, um, really loving that big city lifestyle, big job, you know, shining mm-hmm. my shoes every Sunday night. And eventually I just grew pretty burned out by that pace. And I started to, I never got over my homesickness for the West Coast, uh, BC, and like, that's where I grew up. And one night or one morning I had this dream that I was walking along a forest, a coastal forest path, and I could hear the crash of the surf and I could hear the bald eagles crying and I could smell the the duff, like the, the forest floor, and I could smell the cedars. And it was one of those dreams that makes you wake up in a like a start, like you sit bolt upright. Mm-hmm. And I thought, okay, I've got to go home. Um, mm-hmm. And So this, the landscape really pulled me back and it was also an easy decision to make because at that time it was March in Toronto and it was very cold and I could just hear people crunching along the sidewalk outside my window. And I thought, okay, I can go back to the West coast where it's a little milder, but making those big decisions to leave a job, leave your home, move across the country. uh, They can be really hard on the body and it can be very fatiguing to just make a decision let alone move and looking back you know I moved with spices and half bottles of oil because I basically just chucked everything and decided let's go and uh, I think I moved before I could kind of catch up with my decision and the result of all that was a big burnout that fall Mm -hmm. and then I got a six-week flu that winter and it just between the burnout and the flu I felt totally fatigued and the thing that brought me back to myself was doing these hikes in the North Shore Mountains which are the local mountains around Vancouver and I was doing these little day hikes and thought oh I'm starting to feel more like myself like really getting back to this creative life force that really propels me along 
And I wonder if other people would be interested in knowing about this. Like maybe I'll start a blog to capture some of these hikes in the nearby mountains. And I mentioned this idea to my friend, Kate. And Kate Harris is an author and adventurer. And we became friends when I edited her book, Lands of Lost Borders, which is about cycling the Silk Road from um, Istanbul to India. So like a genuine adventurer. And she said, you know, this idea you have to start a blog is kind of boring. Um, but what about seeing these champion trees? And she just heard about this thing called the BC Big Tree Registry and the champion trees. And so I decided to commit to it on the spot. And I started a blog to capture these visits to the trees, which grow all over a huge geographically diverse province. And because overachieving habits die hard, I thought, oh, I can probably do this in a year. <laughs> and I set out to do it. <laughs> well done. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I feel like saying for those of you listening, A, I think most of us and our beautiful ears out in the world really understand burnout and fatigue, you know, and mm-hmm. when life gets too fast and too loud and too noisy and the body just yearns for that solitude of cocooning and that very nourishing crash to recuperate, reset, and just let the senses rebalance and equilibrate find their equilibrium um and the other piece is I've also had moments where very vivid dreams call me you know Mm -hmm. and and it's so clear and it's just like it's like a really clear text message from my soul calling me to action and I and I think it's really good to talk about that and also take heed of those creative messages that are pulsing through us and maybe coming up as symbols or intuitions or memories or stories or you know the dream world the invisible world is very potent and you know some people journal about it others like you and me we just take action and we go I've I've got a similar story to what you just shared and I, I think that's really good for for listeners just to think about your own version of that um and my third comment so far, because I'm curious, I really want to keep hearing more of what you have to say, is um, for, for those of us who are quite sensitive and sensory stimulate, like easily sensory stimulated and um, potentially overwhelmed by bigness and fastness and champions and giants, there is a lot of value in blogging and talking about the mundane, the ordinary and the local and the subtle. And there's a whole audience of people who don't need marathons and don't need Olympic gold medals and big things. And and I think there's a lot of beauty in that discovery, which really came through in your book. Do you want to share a little bit about the crash and burn of um, (laughs) trying to find the big giants and they're difficult to find so many obstacles along the way, but then the real, what I would describe as your discovery of the subtle and the local. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Big reframing. So setting out to find these big trees, um, I thought it would be really easy because they're the biggest and surely the biggest tree would stand out. But the the thing about champion trees, it's they're big based on context. So a big Douglas fir, like a champion Douglas fir or a cedar would be big, but a champion Sitka alder might just be a bush. Mm-hmm. And if you're looking for a bush in a forest, it's very difficult so mm-hmm. I realized that this project was both way out of my, I was way out of my depth because I didn't have the skills I needed to actually get into these backcountry areas mm-hmm. to find these trees. Mm-hmm. I didn't know how to measure them. I hardly knew how to identify them. Mm-hmm. And I was really failing at this tree, this tree project that I thought was going to be a nice way to bring me back from burnout is that I would mm-hmm. be in nature. And really I spent more of my time driving driving from site to site, trying to find these trees. And I had some successes with early trees because Vancouver is in the middle of an old growth forest, right? So you can still find these big trees. And a lot of the champions or a few of the champions were around Vancouver. Um, But I initially put a lot of pressure on these trees as a way through the big questions in my life. I thought, um, you know, standing in front of these trees will give me transcendence and answer all these questions that I have as some a woman in her late 30s you know like should I have a family should I um, do this job do that job and it didn't come out like that at all because generally when I found a giant I was just really tired and I was worried about losing the light and I thought I gotta go 
um, maybe measure it, kind of half ass measure and get going. Yeah. And the project that I was supposed to bring back from burnout just started to bum me out and I was at the risk of burning out again. But what really reframed it for me um, was I started to shift the timeline. I, it was originally a year to find 43 trees. And I thought maybe I can do 18 months. You know, we start to give ourselves a little bit of gentle space. And then I realized um, that it, I just wasn't going to be able to wrap up the project at all. So I would close with the biggest ones, which were on Vancouver Island. But then something happened that changed everything for all of us, which was the pandemic. Mm-hmm. And I was suddenly stuck where I was, which is a beautiful corner of the world in Vancouver. And I was doing loops of my neighborhood, like everyone else, just going mm-hmm. for neighborhood walks. And I started to really notice these trees around me mm-hmm. um, of all shapes and sizes, and they were native and imported. And then I noticed that through the the concrete, there it was originally the streets were paved in wood, and that was starting to come through. And I noticed the mosses and the mushrooms and start to really shift the perspective from big to small Mm -hmm. and through feeling really small in the scheme of things I realized that my project as I say in the book like my project was a pop tart and the universal toaster like Mm -hmm. it just didn't matter at all and the trees didn't care if I came to find them and that we do this so often in our life where we are searching for the biggest and best things so when I've been questing after my career for so long like you lose sight of the stuff along the way yeah. like friends or health or other like running a marathon you know or not <laughs> or baking a like my my mission right now is to bake fruitcake I'm like I can do this I know I can um and uh or like we start looking for our perfect mate or a perfect house and forget all the things I want to I want to say like it's um, one of the big philosophical and cultural shifts for folks that join my Rocksteady community and take the self-study process. And we have live calls and live groups and it really is an immersion into this paradigm shift. And it's a paradox too, that if we simplify things down to two different ways of viewing the world, for example, we can just look at moss in the crack between the concrete pavers And we can get very physical and material and technical about it. We could measure it. We could describe its color, its form. We could look at all the different thousands of species living in the moss, all the micro living beings. We could identify it. Um, We could state its, you know, photosynthetic value and hydration value. We could weigh it. So we can be very technical. We can quantify. We can examine. We can dissect or dissect. and really that that's that's the world based on material judgment and that's how a lot of us are trained taught educated and when it comes to medical conditions that's the diagnostic pathway and abnormal need a cure all that language right it's really heavy or we can sort of just let that sit over there quietly for a moment and we can step into what some people might call a spiritual reality and what i would call a sensual reality of allowing the brain to drop into the body and really sense and feel through like a body scan. How am I relating to this moss? How am I feeling the moss? What emotions come to me as I connect to this moss? What, in what ways do I identify or relate to the moss? In what ways do I feel different to the moss? And it becomes more of like a spiritual inquiry where the moss becomes a reference point from the natural world of which we're a part. And the moss has its role in the ecosystem Moss is incredible, actually, you know, the way it, in Australia, it, it creates beautiful hydration carpets, that, which is so essential for bushfire prevention. And moss is often a pioneer surface for then other seeds to implant into the moss, like a little nursery incubator. And that seed can then take root and grow into this incredible tree, but it started in moss. So moss is just, it has such a vast ecological role. What's my ecological role? What am I offering to the planet and to the world? And these, this is the spiritual reality, which a person could completely deny, dismiss and ignore, or a person can open up to this different way of feeling and being sensual in the body and understanding that we have our internal landscapes. We have our internal rivers and mountains and rocks and barren countrysides and fertile lush rainforests all of that's within us metaphorically 
through the patterns and cycles of life. And I feel like it's such an invisible, subtle process, which from that sort of patriarchal perspective, it can be so easy to poo-poo and stamp down and really dismiss, ignore, diminish, belittle. But I'm seeing more and more, and it comes through in your book, Amanda, collectively on the planet, more and more of us are needing to come home to our sensual selves, to our animal Mm -hmm. selves to the wild impulse of my desire, my yearning, my grief, and to feel it and Mm -hmm. to really go into nature and cry with the clouds and scream with the cliff face or to roll and giggle and laugh in the grass and really feel our sensuality coming back to life. And you use that word beautifully of feeling my creative life force move through me again. Mm -hmm. That I think when we objectify ourselves and live in this separationist world of the material, that you and I are separate beings and we're not connected. It's lonely, it's depressing, it's isolating, and our life force suffers. So it, to me, it feels we actually need a healthy balance of both the material world that we can measure and quantify, and also the spiritual reality, which is the invisible, mental, emotional, spiritual layers, stories, narratives, thoughts, dreams, sensations that are connecting us with everything, both the inanimate and the animate. So it's it's, it's a really exciting place to get that vitality and vibrancy back through the human body to reclaim our life force and in many ways to embrace our eccentric to embrace our weird our clumsy our awkward so um i'd love you to share a little bit about your version of beyond the material quantification and that other story Mm -hmm. so one yeah one of the ways i did it with writing the book is so writing, so again, I work as a book editor and I've been doing this for almost 20 years and writing a book is very difficult. It's really challenging. It's an immense use of energy. And when people say, I want to write a book, I often say, well, why? Like, why would you want to? There are other ways you could achieve that goal or use your time. Um, and I think one of the reasons that writing is so difficult is that it's it's such a flat enterprise like and it's it's pretty lonely and there are ways to make it less lonely like writing groups and beta readers and Mm -hmm. all that but it's just you engaging with this flat surface and writing this tree book essentially um it was a big challenge because the issues around trees are so heavy and important Mm -hmm. like deforestation bushfires or wildfires climate change um, colonialism like go on and on and on and they even the black market you know people yeah yeah like legally yeah um, yeah harvesting ancient trees it's actually quite devastating yeah the timber poaching um it is devastating for these individual trees and ecosystems and but I didn't want to write a very depressing book because I was feeling so jubilant about being out like looking at these trees and the way my project shifted is I gradually started stopped focusing on these big single things and sort of focusing on this interconnected ecosystem. Mm. And I generally did things on my own because I'm just kind of individualist by nature. Um, but I thought that I would have success that way, but that's what capitalism tells us is that we need to strive on our own and not ask for help and that we're competing with ourselves and with others. And when I let that down, that, that pressure down, um, I actually had more success by, you know, joining with friends in the forest and actually enjoying myself and like bringing snacks and sitting on logs and sliding down hills and like, yeah, getting into the sensual nature of it. So I wanted the book and the writing of it to feel like have that sense of vitality. Mm. And a friend recently read the book and she said, um, the end of the book has this like upswelling where you seem so happy and so content. And I said, yeah, like that was true and also intentional. <laughs> um, the book has these like three movements of feeling. The first is very frenetic and and it's that burnout phase because goal driven. Yeah, goal driven. We're trying to get over burnout because it feels so bad. And <laughs> we want to go after the thing that's going to help us. But really the way through burnout, as we know, is to the opposite Mm. um and then the middle of the book is this depression where I really grapple with these goals the goal isn't working like I'm not going to achieve it um and in terms of writing and the creativity of it like I I did write the ending before I fully lived it 
which is a funny thing to experience because um, I think I, I wasn't even aware of it until it came out. And then I realized I was living the life that I'd written in the book. And at the time, it probably felt aspirational. It's got but good. now I feel this, yeah, I feel this like great, <laughs> great contentment with it. And I didn't, like I said, I didn't want to write a typical tree book. So I call this my weird tree book. Um, it still lives on the shelf beside Suzanne Simard and John Valiant and these tree books. But I thought I want there to be space for the creatives in the forest and the artists and that you can go in the forest and come out again and be just your same self, like be more of yourself and not turning yourself into an adventurer. But I became more of Amanda, the artist, when I went through this forest journey. And I think a lot of people... But in my experience, people feel like they have to ask permission or be invited into the forest because they're not arborists or they're not forest technologists, but really we are nature and you can just be in that landscape you know, safely, of course, yeah. um, but it's for you to experience. Yeah, I feel like reiterating and thank you for sharing all of this so eloquently. Yeah, um, I feel like reiterating some of those points may have been a little lost the listeners potentially so I want to sort of recap sure that we were talking about the burnout and you know insert your own difficult moment there Mm -hmm. and that can often come from that too fast culture too much lots of goals lots of agenda lots of expectations lots of pressure and our body and brains just sort of go shut down meltdown had enough go away dark room leave me alone right we get that and then um, Amanda was sort of saying comically how her brain was like, I'll fix this and creating another goal-driven agenda, which is actually the same pattern that initiated the burnout, that goal-driven agenda to find the big trees and connect with nature and this will heal me. That could be the equivalent of trying to get rid of tinnitus. We've got this goal, we've got this treatment, we've got this plan, trying to get rid of it, trying to get rid of my dizziness, trying to do all these exercises. I'm goal-driven. I'll do this. I'll do this. And it's actually the same mental, emotional, spiritual pattern that possibly generated the symptoms in the first place so really we're repeating this all the same strategies and and you know it's not too surprising when nothing changes so Mm -hmm. we might be trying too hard with too many goals too many expectations too much agenda too much rigid need for outcomes you know wake up every day is my tinnitus here you know yes no present absent you know is my dizziness here present absent and that keeps us stuck in the trap of symptom focus the goals, the agenda, the expectations, it's very difficult for the brain to use neuroplasticity and create a new sense of sensory normal um, with that goal-driven patterning and agenda. So that was what Amanda really beautifully um, spoke to. And then there was the the grief and the sorrow and the flatness and the depression of realizing, ah, my big plan is hard and not working and I'm feeling yeah. all the same yucky things again and we sort of go into this plateau which is really potent for the healing journey and I celebrate this flat stage because often this dark pit of despair is a pivotal place where we begin to sort of drop our defenses and protect protection mechanisms and strategies and go I don't know what to do anymore and that's powerful because that's when we begin to open up to novel ways of approaching this the situation And we shift away from that strictly material perspective of are my symptoms there, are they cured, what's the treatment, goal, goal, goal. And we begin to drop our defences and enter into that courageous and humble mystery of not knowing, which is actually really wisdom because Mm -hmm. we don't know in any moment what's arising, what's shaping us, what's transforming us, what's entering us, what we're processing and metabolising. It is all a massive mystery here and now, right now. And when we can enter that mystery and stay grounded and solid and have tools to really metabolize and process life, that's when ideas flow, creativity flows. We actually have space because we're not chasing anymore. We're present. We're available. We're porous. And so we actually fundamentally shift the way we relate to our body, the way we relate to the world, and we start to create new patterns The brain changes, we activate different parts of the brain and we begin to form these new neural synaptic connections which create new neural sensory patterns. So I have seen many, many people go from that that burnout, shutdown, meltdown, really difficult, dark place 
become very goal oriented and burn themselves out again, end up in that pit of despair where they're very potentially suicidal and just at their wits end, and then really surrender, enter this place of humility and mystery and surprise themselves with how they completely overcome their symptoms. They rebuild a new normal. They rediscover who they are and how they relate to the world, how they treat themselves. And while, yes, they may have passing intermittent, random, not quite right sensations, it no longer stays stuck in the pattern. Things come and go. They move through the body. They process, they digest, they eliminate, and they just live a normal life. Um, so it's, I really want to speak a little bit to that process of accessing the creative self that you spoke to. Mm-hmm. And I think that's something we don't talk about enough in the Rocksteady community. It's all in there, but often I think I want to expand this conversation of um. We, we're all creative in our own way, I think, you know. It's not like there are creatives and non-creatives. We're all creative in our own way. Some people might be creative with mathematics and other people might be creative with fishing, others with house cleaning, but we have our own avenues of expression of life force. And um, I don't know if you want to speak to a little bit about your relationship to creativity and maybe even juxtaposing periods of your life where you weren't creating output versus times in your life where you were actively cultivating creative output and just how that felt for you and and your sense of embodiment yeah so I I really liked what you said about creativity can be like house cleaning or fishing and this is something I say all the time to writers um uh, enough as as many people say I want to write a book as say I can't write I don't have a book idea I'm not creative and I believe everyone is creative. Like we're all creative, like we're literally creative beings. That's why we're here. Mm-hmm. And so we've just put these pressures again on our creativity to look a certain way. Mm-hmm. And that was the real shift for me with my project is I was trying to do a project the way I imagined um, someone who knew what they were doing would do. Like an adventurer would do it this way. Um, an arborist would do it this way. Like I should be able to measure a tree by now, but who knows how to measure a tree? It's not something we do in our day-to-day life. Like it's a little bit complicated. It's not too, you know, you can learn it, but it's not, it's not just something we know how to do. Mm. And the real shift for me was through the creative process. And I remember I was sitting at home one day feeling like a total failure, you know, and not blogging about any of my attempts to find these trees I thought no one would want to read about that and I realized oh this is this is what the creative process is this is what I guide writers through all the time Mm -hmm. Um, as an editor is that they have an idea for a project and they get really excited about it and they rush off and try to do it and they find that it is a lot harder it needs more time it needs more research they find that their writing skills aren't really where they thought they were um, or something sets them back in some way and they they just slump over it. And then my role as an editor is to help them reframe it mm. and steer them to a new ending. And the reframing is really important because it's also uh, making the writing feel really possible. And I realized that I was doing the same thing with this tree project. It was a huge project. It was way too big. And I needed to reframe it to something possible. Mm. And then I thought, oh, this is, this is how I can put my stamp on this. And this is how tree tracking that's what we call it looking for big trees tree tracking can be inherently creative Mm -hmm. and the other way through that for me was when I realized and this was in conversation with another writer named Catherine Kuttenbrauer um, that the act of doing something that's anti-productive and Jenny O'Dell speaks about this in her book how to do nothing as well but anti-productive acts that are just purely creative Mm -hmm. are for their own sake and they're anti-capitalistic in nature. And that's something to be celebrated, right? That we don't always have to do something. So it adds up to something else. Mm -hmm. Um, Oliver Berkman also writes about this in his great book, 4,000 Weeks, where he's like, why are we counting our steps? We could just go for a walk. (laughs) Like, it doesn't all have to be an activity, you know, leading us somewhere. And when I was a book editor, um I I felt like I had I mean I'm still a book editor but when I was a book editor in Toronto I felt like I had to 
kind of tamp down my own creativity. Like I'm in service of the writer. I'm in service of the reader. I'm going to use my creativity over the next X years of my career to really serve that writer. And I'll make stuff in my retirement, you know, because I like to make crafts, and that, but I don't have time for that now. And that I think was what burned me out the most is that I just wasn't indulging my own creative thing. And it did come out in certain ways when I lived in Toronto, like I co-founded a literary festival called The Reading Line. And that blends the worlds of books and bikes and did other various like creative community things, but nothing that felt kind of mine. Um, And then when I moved back to BC and started shifting how I approach my editing, I really leaned into co-creation as my main tool for editing. And I realized that that is a better way forward, but also really respects the role of the editor. Like that we are your creative partner and we are, and that you're a human as creative and we're human and we need to express ourselves there's that, <laughs> yeah. there's that yeah. exchange between not just the author and their book and then the yeah. editor being like this machine but yeah but more that the editor is bringing that whole human self to the process their questions their sensitivities their reactions their responses their dreams you know um and that about that's validating for us as humans, as opposed yeah. to feeling again, objectified, separate or cloned, like we're supposed to operate as some unfeeling machine. Mm-hmm. Can I speak to a little bit, you spoke about um, that feeling of, and this is not your words, but I was almost sensing this like shunting of creative energy. Like, mm-hmm. like you know, I'm in the city, I'm doing the job. I've got to be professional. I've got to yeah. shine my shoes. I've got to show up in certain ways. <laughs> yeah. And it's just like the whole body's going, ooh, 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 ooh. Like my authentic self just can't move here. I've, I've got this much <laughs> yeah. wiggle room. And yeah. it's like so exhausting. Whereas when we let that creative energy freely express and flow and have that output, we get mm-hmm. life force, vitality, vibrancy. And this is where personally I'm so excited to learn more about the neurodiversity in humanity, being yeah. a bit of a neuroscience geek myself and just how – for so many of us, for so many years, we've been told by teachers and parents how we should be, how we should stand, how we should sit, how we should speak, how we should present ourselves. When it's actually really beautiful and healthy to embrace your tics, embrace your quirks, embrace your twitchy body or your fidgeting fingers, because that is your nervous system moving pent up energy through the body. So the body doesn't have to hold it and accumulate trauma from all this unexpressed life force. And you know, this is the topic of my book I'm writing, um, which, by the way, I'm the opposite. I dwell on an idea just in this sort of like messy, chaotic, mysterious, pensive, lone, not lonely, a lone place, this place of solitude, mm-hmm. possibly for years, you know. And then suddenly it's like something, my soul knocks me on the shoulder and is like, you got to write that book. And I sit down and I literally vomit onto the computer and it writes itself and it's pure joy it flows out quickly and it it feels like um, I'm in this rich conversation with a community, with friends. Like I feel it's like I've got the microphone and everyone's listening and it's it's mm-hmm. this, this incredibly intense offloading process. Um, so that's how my creativity moves through me and, you know, I might write one song a year. So it's not necessarily weekly or monthly. It just sort of blah. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and we're all different and it's good to honour that difference in our creative processes. Um, mm-hmm. But, yeah, I think getting this conversation of creativity and owning for our listeners that you got it. Everyone's got creative life force. You know, as women, we create babies if we want to. Like that's that's the almighty creation. You know, that's huge. We are literally creative beings. And men too. Men are creating that life force. Yeah. So like there's just in so many levels we're creating, we're creating every time we cook, you know, and I think connecting to what your uh, most available and accessible creative output is and exploring, whether it's just daydreaming while you walk around the block, whether it's allowing your creative cooking to just edge you a little bit into that courageous place of mystery where you take a few more cooking risks and just let it flow, whether it's, like um, Julia Cameron style artist way, just writing without editing every day, just to see what comes out of you. Um, do you have any other ideas that you've come across that just to 
um, prick people's interest of what they could perhaps experiment with if they're stuck? Yeah, um, I mean, painting. Like I, I recently painted a tree for a friend's birthday and I just decided to start with pink. Yeah. <laughs> just keep layering. Um, I really love sorting things out. Like my mm -hmm. big stress reliever during grad school was I'd buy bags of mis mixed buttons, like old buttons and sort them out by color and shape yeah um so that's really calming to me and um yeah I think I, I'm also a big fan of of movement so yoga um mm -hmm. but also like tensegrity movement so just find a movement that feels good and it's repetitive and like get the get it flowing out of you it it's something I read this in big magic uh, recently um by mm -hmm. Elizabeth Gilbert where mm -hmm. she said it took me forever to realize this and I keep forgetting it and relearning it but if I'm not busy creating something I'm busy destroying something Ooh, and that, that could be yeah. a relationship a job a this or that like she has to be creating <clears throat> and I think that is very true of most of us is that yeah. if we're not creating we're destroying we're burning it down yeah and um, then you know, and that could yeah. also look like huge worry ruminations and yes it's almost like worry can be that creative energy with nowhere to go and so the brain's just like, I've got exactly. to put it somewhere. So it's like, I can't leave the house. I can't drive my car. I can't do this. I can't do yeah. that. Whereas what if we put that into arranging flowers? In fact, that struck yeah. me one day. I went out with my two little toddlers, my boys, <laughs> and we just picked flowers from the garden. It was so simple. And we arranged a vase. Mm -hmm. We put them on the table for dinner. And I was like, this really lights me up. It was so simple. And it's like, wow. You know, it was always like, why don't I do this more often? Just, just really accessing those simple ways of letting exactly. creative life force flow very organically with no rules. That's no gold medal. I'm not selling a product. It's just flowing. And I really encourage you as listeners to explore this for yourself. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a fun book, actually, Big Magic as well. Yeah, exactly. And, I mean, the activity of the flower gathering and arranging that you shared it probably took five minutes right yeah. didn't take that long and this is what like this everyday act of creativity maybe you if you're listening and you're driving home like turn right instead of left and yeah. see like explore a new neighborhood oh yeah um, yeah it's that is another way to just it awaken that creative self mm. yeah get out of those old habituated patterns that we might not be sure why we're doing them anymore we just keep doing them and yeah. and you know holding all of it really lightly too and uh, wherever possible when we can bring in a sense of the absurd or comedy or playfulness they really help with curiosity and some of these courageous acts of going into the unknown they help shift us from the geeky neuroscience point of view they help shift us shift us from the middle of the brain and the midbrain where we've got the emotional limbic system and a lot of our fight flight freeze trauma patterns and worries are really circulating around that middle area of the brain when we get playful curious when we body scan we shift all that brain activity up here when we're feeling and sensing through the proprioceptive system when we get absurd and playful and creative and we go left instead of right or right instead of left and we start being a little novel and different, playful I think is a really key quality here. We actually shift to the prefrontal cortex and all that blood flow and oxygen and sugar stimulation in the brain come up here where the brain can create new problem solving. It has access to new neuroplasticity options, new synapses, new networks, but in going left instead of right, vice versa. If we're not used to that way, we can feel not quite right. We can feel unfamiliar. We can feel awkward. We can feel naughty. We can feel silly, right? Mm -hmm. So we have to feel all those feels as we go on that creative little journey and let new parts of our brain light up. But that can be ultimately, ultimately what shapes us, what grows us, what transforms us, and what allows what we're calling this healing process to unfold. And I say the word healing sort of with um, hesitancy because I deeply believe we are already whole. We're already here, mm -hmm. here and now. We have everything we need. It's just when are we going to realize that there's nothing to fix or change? We're simply in a process of evolving and allowing creative life force to change us, to move us, to grow us. And when we block that process and we try and be who we were three years ago or 30 years ago, we're just constantly setting ourselves up for disappointment and rigidity. So 
it, it really is that cultural shift, um, which, which probably doesn't come overnight. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I really agree with that. Amanda, any yeah. any closing words of encouragement or inspiration um, to yeah. people who may be in an experience of burnout or somewhere along that line of feeling very goal-driven, lacking creativity, maybe they're in the dark pit of despair. But any, if you could speak to that version of yourself maybe sure. and offer younger Amanda some encouragement, <laughs> what would you say to younger Amanda perhaps? To younger Amanda, I would actually say play more and take more breaks. Yeah. Um, I really drove myself very hard through my 20s. And I think this is very common for this kind of type A person. The early 20s are very hard because we're trying to set things up mm. and we're trying to excel and we're trying to do this program and you know network this way and that way. And for some people, it's fine. It works for them really well. But for, um, for me, and I think people like me who are goal oriented, but also highly sensitive, mm. it can be this kind of dangerous combo. And there's nothing wrong with goals. This is what I'd also say to you um, who are listening and feeling this. Like I, I have lots of goals. I love goals. I love plans. Mm. And, but I've learned to really temper them with what is possible. And if I feel myself edging into burnout, I just say, oh, not worth it. Like, is it, do I really want to do this? Um, so for example, this week I, I was applying for a, a grant, uh, like a literary grant and I did the application and then I looked at the other one that I was going to apply to and I thought it was due in a few weeks and it was due in two days. And I thought, I can't, <laughs> I can't do this. Old me would have just pushed through and said, you know, I'll just do it because might as well. I'm like, let's it's mm-hmm. just, are you doing this or not? And um, it's just not a gentle way. It's just not kind to yourself. And I'm trying to always be extra kind to myself and set myself up like my future self to be really kind and loving. Mm-hmm. What that looks like for me right now as another way to avoid burnout is um, is to embrace where I am and like to feel the feelings. Mm-hmm. And I'm developing really solid boundaries around things. And mm-hmm. I used to think boundaries were really rigid in a way of blocking people out. And now I realize that they're just so kind to your nervous system. Mm-hmm. And they are the antidote to that rumination. And I mean, I was awake between 2 and 4 a.m. today ruminating about old conversations like there's no quick fix right you're we're always gonna feel like like you said evolving and but it's just to embrace like okay I'm ruminating that's funny like perfect to do anything about this when I actually am up maybe there's nothing to fix you know really trusting the wisdom in the rumination and that that's another form of release but also it might give us material for the next book you know you just know it's totally did yeah (laughs) and that's what elizabeth gilbert would say in big magic is like are we willing to capture those ideas and thoughts and actually use them Mm -hmm. as creative inspiration instead of going oh i shouldn't be ruminating i should be better by now i should be able to meditate with a clear mind and we just set ourselves all these unachievable goals which are somebody else's which are it's somebody else yeah you're following yeah you're following a life path set by somebody else and i mean how often have you um replayed a conversation and then oh i wish i had said this instead right and that, that is a creative act, right? That is your brain trying to make peace with this thing and look for a new way through it. And it's playful. And that's to be embraced, not to be shamed. Yeah, beautiful. And, you know, I'm also here with, um, I had an aha moment parenting with my young boys when it was like, I was at a crossroads of just being like, I don't know what to do here. I'm the parent and something. I can't remember the example, but I thought back to playing my violin and learning by ear like a folk player and the the thing is, is you don't know what the note is you're learning. So you sort of, you you listen, you play and you might get a note right or wrong, it lands and you just keep going until you get the notes and the fingers find the notes and it's it's literally a trial and error process of did that work, did that feel right, you know, and, and your body or my body is learning how to be in resonance and synchronicity with the music and the band or whatever. And part of me is like, this is what parenting is too. It's like you give it a go and if it doesn't feel right and doesn't land well between me and my child, then my my brain does that thing where it reflects on, okay, well, how can I do it differently next time? And I problem solve and I get creative and I think, okay, well, if that happens again, I won't do that. <laughs> that was a dud. 
but I'll try something different based on what I learned in that experiment. And it, I feel mm-hmm. like it really holds a lightness. There's not shame. It's that full creative process of understanding, Definitely. you know, you, it's just one step at a time and it's all about gathering data and mm-hmm. then making a little analysis, getting creative and trying again. And then you try again and then you try again and this building, building, building. And so, yeah, I feel like that's um, rich as humans. Just living is creating. <laughs> totally agree. Yeah. And and running these little experiments. Like I was talking to my best friend yesterday about something that I keep doing. I'm like, why do I keep doing this? Like, I just keep, I can't get out of this loop. And she said, um, yeah, you're running an experiment. You've run it a few times and now that you realize it doesn't work yeah and it doesn't doesn't help you and now you can just like let it go yeah like yeah exactly it's just an experiment so gentle (laughs) beautiful yeah thank you for your time today amanda now for our podcast listeners Mm. are you able to speak aloud any um website links that people might want to look up if they want if they're interested in reading a book or (laughs) just um getting you on as an editor but where where would they go to connect with you so the best way to connect with me is on my website, which is amandalewis.org. <clears throat> Excuse me. So A-M-A-N-D-A-L-E-W-I-S dot O-R-G. And you'll find everything on there about my editing and my services. And there is a book page on there for Tracking Giants, which is the book. And you can buy that anywhere books are sold. Yeah, beautiful. I feel like summering up, some summarizing this chat, my, my words <laughs> of law today. It's okay. Um, by saying, I personally believe this is this is my political self speaking, that all voices matter and that all human stories are beautiful, and I really want to encourage all of you listening that if it speaks to you to write your story, and to possibly find a safe, supportive community or a book coach or, you know, whatever lands for you, whether it's a friend. I have a writing friend who helped me with writing my book. Um, she called it an accountability partner. And so mm-hmm. it was fun. You know, we'd light a candle, we'd meet up and we'd read each other's work or just get, gave, gathered that momentum and that human connection. And um, I feel like saying you might sit there and think my story is boring. Why would I share? No one wants to read my story. And it's not really about who reads it. I think it's more the process of actually writing and understanding that every human story matters. And it's mm-hmm. not entertainment, you know, it's it's really mm-hmm. about sharing the relatedness, the interconnectedness, um, our sovereignty, but also that sense that, I don't know, it's just, it's got, it's got to do with this expression piece that it's, it's about sort of honouring yourself enough to say, I'm curious to read my story because you won't know what comes out until you start. And, you know, it'll start just one piece at a time and you'll forget this thing and then you'll remember that thing and then that will trigger another memory and then that and that and then you'll connect that with that. You might love to read your story. So I just really want to encourage you to, if you feel that, you know, it can be very informative and very healing to write and to get to know yourself through that layered process of revealing and get to knowing and being curious. And Rocksteady is a program is all a self-study and inquiry process. And a lot of people get stuck because they just don't know. They don't know what's in their bodies and they feel blocked and stuck. And, you know, I don't know. I don't know why I'm like this. I don't, you know, they, they don't know where to go. And perhaps writing or tapping or journaling or could be a way to free up some of that information and just give yourself some data to work with. So you've got this experiment that's alive and alive, you know, alive and awake and moving, rolling, organic. So, yeah, I feel like just really being encouraging of that and, you know, really taking it away from being a bestseller or published, but just writing for the sake of that expressive journey where perhaps you are your best key audience and that's complete. Who knows? I totally agree. Yeah. And it doesn't need to be a memoir necessarily. And it doesn't, because then we put all this pressure on ourselves, like my story doesn't matter. Like you were saying, <laughs> and all stories matter and yeah, the very act of writing can lead you down a creative pathway you'd never dreamed of. Yeah, And I mean, my book started as blog entries, right? And then I then turned into a book. 
But what might be exciting is if you start writing and allow it to become another form like fiction or a play, because like what better way to heal than to get to rewrite your story. And like I shared about the ending of my book, I wrote the ending that I wanted to live and then I stepped into it Hmm. and that was my way through. Yeah, which is also a therapeutic tool. You know, Mm -hmm. that's in my new book coming, I talk about how the invisible, that mental, emotional, spiritual really precedes the physical. For example, I have an idea to write. I haven't written yet. The idea is just sort of floating in my vortex, in my field, in my energy body. And I can ignore that and keep squashing that idea. I might keep coming back, keep pushing it away. But one day that invisible space will actually land in my physical body and turn into an action, a behavior. It will it will physically move through me. Um, and so as you, you, you talk about, you created that invisible space where you could then walk into and manifest as a physical reality. And, yeah. and that's often how it works. It starts with the invisible realm and then we embody it. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much, Amanda. Thank you, Joey. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, for those listening, again, I'm Joey Remini from seekingbalance.com.au. You are welcome to join my free community. I've got a free starter kit and a free Facebook group where people really talk about how they're using neuroplasticity to overcome chronic symptoms of tinnitus, dizziness, vertigo, and more. And then if you're interested to dive into my community further, the Rocksteady program is the place to go, or you can read my Rocksteady book. So seekingbalance.com.au. Thanks again. And a bye for now.